the Cavalier Parliament. This is the second parliament in England for uh, Charles II. And this is quite a long parliament, lasts for, what, 18 years. Um, so this is a, a, a long tenure for a parliament uh, in the history of England. It's, it's heavily royalist. Um, again, I think the, the public sentiment was, okay, let's return to monarchy and let's calm things down. And everybody's sort of on board with bringing Charles back. And so uh, the parliament is royalist because I think the general population was royalist in feeling. We, we, of course, still have a lot of religious dissenters and we do have, um, you know, some groups, uh, you know, like the Quakers, which uh, some things about them will come up uh, that are, are pretty uh, cantankerous sort of people regarding like the conformity to the Church of England. And, um, and I should say that uh, <clears throat> I come out of the Quaker uh, tradition. So uh, I didn't grow up as a Quaker, but in my late teens, I became a Quaker. And even at one point, I was uh, 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 a clergy member of, of the Quaker church. Um, and, and, uh, you know, so I kind of focus in in this later portion on on some things that have to do with uh, Quakers because um, because it's just something interesting, but also it kind of draws out some of the the, the troubles uh, here. Now, um, you know, I, I should say that uh, you know Quakers are universalist to a lot of large extent, which means that. Um, Quakers believe that everyone has uh, a connection to God, uh, regardless of what your ritualistic or beliefs, uh, your ritualistic practices are, or your beliefs are. Everyone has access to 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 God, and and um, and God can speak through anyone, um, you know, which creates a very tolerant sort of attitude, uh, but. But then, um, especially at this time, they're real sticklers for things like said in the, the Sermon on the Mount, and I had to read the Sermon on the Mount. Um, so they're they're strictly nonviolent. So they don't they refuse to um, serve as soldiers, and that causes problems. And they Jesus said, you know, don't swear upon anything. Let your yes be yes, your no no. So they don't take oaths. And so this becomes a big issue at in this time in England. Uh, the uh, Quakers are very suspect because they don't want to take oaths. And so they kind of turn the screws on Quakers in, in that regard. And, um, and, uh, and then I should say also that I'm, you know, uh, I'm, of course, influenced by Quakerism, but I, I wouldn't call myself Quaker uh, nowadays, or or even a religious person in any way. Um, but uh, but uh, I want to I want to pay attention to that line of things and and point out some some interesting things that emerge here. So what happens is that the Cavalier Parliament reverses most of the legislation of the Long Parliament. And so they try to undo everything that happened during the Republican phase of the English government and return it to a strictly monarchy type government structure. Uh, and part of that is to strengthen the Church of England. And this is where the Quakers come into play because um, the Anglicans are are prejudicial against against Catholics, against Puritans, and against Quakers. And there's other people out there too, but I'm going to just limit it to these three examples. Uh, and there is a lot of religious, and I guess that's what started me out on this tangent, is that there's a lot of religious experimentation at this time in England, 
people are reading the Bible in English, the King James Version of the Bible is available because James I, back at the beginning of the century, issued the King James Bible. And so people are reading the Bible uh, on a generational sort of level for the first time in their own language, in a, in a form that's like really their own language. That's the way they spoke. It was, they spoke in King James English. And they're starting to get their own personal take on Christianity, and this causes a lot of factions. Okay. Um, the Church of England is trying to eliminate the factions and start to use the church as a way to bolster the authority of the monarch. Okay. Then kind of return to something that looks more like feudalism. Uh, but of course, they've already eliminated feudalism. So this is an interesting phase of things. Um, so the Cavalier Parliament uh, passes the Corporation Act, which restricts public office to active members of the Church of England. So you have to be you know, certified as a, a genuine member. Uh, that means Presbyterians and Puritans who are attending separate services, uh, maybe secretly, um, are barred from a lot of positions within uh, the government. Uh, it requires renunciation of the Solemn League and Covenant of 1643. Uh, this is, this is uh, uh, a, an alliance made with the Presbyterians in Scotland back in 1643. Uh, which is all coming out of the, the bishops' war, and then, and then, uh, you know, making an alliance between the Scots and the English in the civil wars, and oaths, an oath of allegiance to the monarch, an oath of supremacy, saying that the Church of England is separate and independent of Rome, which specifically is about eliminating Roman Catholics, but Quakers do not take oaths of any kind. So this disfavors them. And then uh, a restoration of the act of uniformity and all public office only to those who conform to the Anglican ritual it requires congregations to follow uh, Episcopal ordination, not Presbyterian ordination. So it's against the Presbyterians. So now this is causing a rift between Scotland and England, and within England causing a rift with Puritans versus Anglicans and Quakers and other. There's a lot other of other factions that are also getting the short end of the stick here. Um, we have the great ejection of over 2,000 Anglican ministers are expelled from their position. So now you're, this is just stirring the pot again for Puritanism and, and, uh, and, and driving people towards Presbyterianism. And uh, they have the Conventicle Act uh, a little later because it appears that people were meeting in ad hoc assemblies and saying, well, we're just, you know, this is just my family and friends and we're just praying, you know, over this meal. Um, you can't, you know, you can't call that illegal, uh, but it actually, they outlaw uh, assemblies of more than five people for religious purposes. Okay, uh, so that means you can't have a big Thanksgiving dinner and say a prayer. Um, of course, they didn't celebrate Thanksgiving, but Christmas, let's say. Uh, Christmas dinner or something like that, which they didn't really celebrate Christmas like we do at that time either. But something of that sort—you can't have a big banquet, a big, uh, a big uh, wedding, and have a religious aspect to it unless it's strictly Anglican. You could get you could get uh, fined for that. Uh, the Five Mile Act, for those clergy that were expelled, they have to move five miles outside of their parish. So the parish is like the town in which they were a minister, and then they got to move five miles outside of that uh, to keep these expelled clergy from 
starry separatist uh, congregations. But obviously this is an issue. This obviously is going on. That's why they're making a law against it. The government is generally mercantilistic and protectionistic, uh, which means that they try to, they try to uh, uh, accumulate money wealth in the kingdom by making it difficult for foreign competitors. And so this is the opposite of a free market. If you've heard of like free market economics, uh, especially at this time, a free market meant that you allowed foreigners to import goods into your country with little or very low tariffs. They raised the tariffs on foreign um, companies and try to use military means to, you know, get homegrown uh, uh, merchants into foreign markets and um, and the theory is that this accumulates money wealth in the kingdom uh, it it doesn't work okay so it's, it's a failed strategy but intuitively it it, it makes sense and so uh, but this is probably a, a huge mistake in, in the in the the policy of this government. The Poor Relief Act uh, makes it so people who are unemployed can't move from the place in which they are unemployed. So if they want to receive, uh, during Elizabeth's time, the Poor Relief Act was originally instituted and there were government uh, supported welfare type agencies. So the welfare state, uh, you know, goes back to this uh, tradition uh, back at this time, even back to Elizabeth. And, but what they try to do is make it so that if you're unemployed in your hometown, you can't move to another town and also receive unemployment. You have to stay there, which restricts the mobility. And that's really what is meant by liberty in like the, uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in the Declaration of Independence in the United States. Liberty is the, the liberty to move about the country, you know, to not be constrained uh, into some fiefdom in the way that serfs were. And, um, and this, this sort of, this very much restricts the liberty and also, um, you know, then is like a self-feeding downward spiral, uh, a self-reinforcing downward spiral, because if there's no work in your home parish, then you're just gonna be permanently on the dole, uh, you know, receiving welfare, and you can't just move to a neighboring county or go to the city to get employment. Uh, again, it seems like a, a very uh, wrong-headed um, economic approach. Uh, so Charles marries uh, Catherine of Braganza from Portugal, a Catholic country right next to Spain. You know, we have Spain and then the coastline is Portugal. Um, and part of the marriage contract was that uh, Portugal offered Charles the city of Tangier uh, in the Maghreb in Northern Africa that I talked about before. Um, the seven islands of Bombay, these are small islands in the, off the city of Bombay that were very, um, very valuable as a trading center, uh, trading privileges with Brazil and the East Indies, uh, religious and commercial freedoms for English in Portugal. Okay, so now uh, English merchants and nobles and other higher ups could go into Portugal and have some legal protection for their religious practices and their business practices, okay? And uh, there's 300,000 uh, pounds as a dowry. <clears throat> and England offers neighbor, naval and military support against the Spanish. So the Portuguese never developed a strong Navy, especially in comparison to Spain, um, the Dutch and British or Dutch and English navies are much more 
much stronger, much larger and more effective. They have better ships and things like that. But, um, but the Portuguese are still contending with Spain in the Americas and trying to protect the, their territory that they have there and maybe expand into territories. And so Spain and Portugal are still butting up against each other. Um, you know, almost, you know, 100, 150 years, uh, more than that, 175 years after, you know, the whole invasion of the Americas uh, started. Uh, so they get married in 1662, and now first they have a private Catholic ceremony. So they're at, they're initially married as Catholics, and then they do a public ceremony as Anglicans, um, which you know technically might fit within the the code of uniformity. Um, now, Charles is, is uh, an interesting character because he is known as the Merry Monarch, and there's lots of partying going on. Uh, during the Protectorate, everything was very grim and uh, militaristic, you know, because Cromwell was a military man and also um, something of a Puritan. Uh, so, you know, no extravagance, all business. Um, and now we're restoring the monarch and it's like, go the other direction. The pendulum swings the other direction and Charles is all for it. And so he's right there, the life of the party and charming people and uh, spending extravagantly. Um, but spending not only on sort of decadent things that are questionable, but also on things that then seem to have value over the long run. Uh, there's a big revival in the arts and sciences, especially theater. Uh, restoration theater is is like a whole genre unto itself because it was so um, so such a, a breath of fresh air after the protectorate and and so uh, that's something that that the British especially look back to as as kind of a high point of this entire period. Uh, he sells Dunkirk, which is a city in the Netherlands, uh, right near, right on the border of France, uh, which then becomes part of France uh, under Louis the Fourteenth. And Louis the Fourteenth is like the biggest monarch on the continent. Um, he has a long reign, so he starts. He starts out as king as a very young man, and then he's very active into his later years, and he's a military person that actually goes out on, on the field, a military general, and he's very effective. Um, and so Louis the Fourteenth is uh, really overshadows every other leader on the continent at this time. And so Charles II is currying favor with Louis. And of course, Louis is Catholic, being French. Um, the Reformation really didn't take hold in France. The sale of Dunkirk is very unpopular because obviously people notice and, uh, and, and they don't like it because uh, it seems like a, a retreat. And also it seems to be currying favor with a Catholic monarch, the Catholic monarch, uh, which sends a signal that Charles is maybe some kind of crypto Catholic, uh, which, he, which he is. It, so <laughs> it's not very crypto, it's not very secret, you know. Um, right about this time now, there's the capture of New Amsterdam in the Americas, and New Amsterdam is renamed to New York. So this is where New York in the United States comes from. Uh, and it's named after the Duke of York, that's James, uh, Charles's brother, who is they're both the son of Charles the first. And so James is the Duke of York and New York is named after him uh, instead of being New Amsterdam. It was a Dutch colony, you know, Amsterdam is in the Netherlands 
and uh, it's captured by the English and renamed New York at this time. This and other things spur the Second Anglo-Dutch War, which ends in disaster for England. Um, so it's not a, a, a great uh, affair. So it's something that discredits the reputation of Charles and the new form of government. There's the Great Plague. So this is bubonic plague. This is a return of the Black Death um, from the medieval period and from the time of Justinian. This is like, there's Justinian's plague that's really huge, wipes out about a third of the population in Europe. There's the back Black Plague, which wipes out about a third of, of nearly half of the population probably in England um, and nearly half of the population in Europe. And then there's the Plague of London, which does not become widespread, but in London um, kills at least a tenth of the population in a very short amount of time. Uh, the next year, there's there's a, the Great Fire of London, where the London practically burns to the ground because there's strong winds, and it's in the fall when people are storing up wood, and so it's a huge conflagration, a big um, disaster. According to accounts, um, Charles and James were on the street fighting fires. Uh, I'm not. I'm not quite sure about that, but uh, that is the story that's told. Um, so you know, uh, uh, there's some sort of propaganda there that that goes in in their in the favor of Charles. There's the triple alliance with the Netherlands and Sweden against France. So now, not long after the Second Anglo-Dutch War. Uh, just in the next year, now England is allying itself with the Netherlands and Sweden against France. So there's this back and forth, like, is, is Charles currying favor with Louis, or is he planning to go to war against Louis? Uh, there's a lot of mixed signals. Um, Queen Catherine has her fourth miscarriage, making James... Duke of York, her the heir apparent. So this is in 1669. So now it seems like, okay, Charles and Catherine are not going to have a child. So the, the throne is going to pass to James, which ultimately it does. Now, as I was saying, there's these mixed signals from Charles. Is he trying to curry favor with Louis or is he trying to build an alliance against Louis and maybe go to war against Louis? Uh, mixed signals in the public sphere. But secretly, Charles makes a treaty with Louis. Charles is going to supply military support uh, against the Dutch. Charles promises to convert to Catholicism publicly when the public is ready for it. And Louis is going to pay a yearly pension of 230,000 pounds to Charles um, and a bonus when he publicly converts to Catholicism. So now Louis is paying Charles and they're colluding in secret against the Dutch and coordinating their foreign policy. But in the public eye, Charles is making ambiguous signals to the public. And, um, and of course, Louis promised to provide significant military support when Charles publicly converts to put down any you know, anti-Catholic rebellion. Um, Charles begins to abandon con colonial control. So Tangier, that's let go. And um, the Isles of Bombay, those are let go. Um, all these things appear to be too expensive. So the mercantilistic strategy uh, that was employed by his uh, you know, treasurer and economist, we might say, um, is not working. 
The East Indian Company is just given carte blanche to run India as they saw fit. They're able to raise an army, they're able to mint money, they can write laws, and this begins uh, the, the really devastation of India, where the East Indian Company now just runs India as a business uh, to extract as much wealth out of it as it possibly can in a very cruel uh, and disastrous way. The Hudson Bay Company is granted full right to the Hudson Bay um, Basin, which is a huge tract of, of territory um, now uh, in modern day Canada, uh, but at the time was controlled by England and it's just granted over to the Hudson Bay Company, a huge windfall um, for the stockholders in this company. Also with the East Indian Company, huge windfall. I mean, the, the East India Company becomes so powerful that in the coming decades that it can't even be contained by the government of England. It's, it's a, like a government unto itself. Um, the Hudson Bay Company uh, also becomes uh, hugely profitable. Uh, there's the Royal Declaration of Indulgence. Now, this is interesting because it suspends the, the penalties for nonconformity. So people can't be fined for not showing up to church and, and fined for the public displays of Catholicism or whatever religion. Um, it's never fully implemented. Um, this is just a royal decree. It's not a law that's passed through, through Parliament. Um, but it does start to take effect and then the Cavalier Parliament does force Charles to withdraw it because there's just, uh, uh, it's just going too far in the direction of Catholicism. And, but they do replace it with the Test Act. And, and so this is kind of a, a compromise uh, or, or uh, not really a compromise, but a, a targeting of of Catholics, you know, because the, the, the de Declaration of Indulgence suggested that Charles was trying to make Catholics be able to be part of the government and hold uh, official positions and even be part of the, the parliament itself. Um, and so the Cavalier Parliament is dead set against that because they've excluded Catholics. And they replace it with the Test Act, and that requires an oath against transubstantiation of the Eucharist. And transubstantiation, and this is kind of Aristotelian, going back to the scholastic Aristotelianism, uh, this is a doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church that says when, when in the ceremony, the ritual of the Eucharist, the taking of the, the bread uh, for lay people and in, in the Eucharist service that I discussed in earlier videos, just in this series, um, that the, the bread literally, or well, I don't know if we wanna say literally, in this Aristotelian way, the, the bread becomes of the same substance with the body of Christ, which is you know, maybe more technically the right way of saying it, but, in the mind of Anglicans and Puritans, what that meant is that when people ate the bread, they were eating human flesh. You know, maybe it's a deliberate misunderstanding, um, but uh, it's no more uh, theologically convoluted than the, than the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, and I talked about that in earlier videos with uh, Jesus being of the same substance with God the Father. Um, it's a similar thing, but just with now with the bread in the Eucharist, the bread is of the same substance as the body of Jesus. And, um, but Puritans especially reject this and Anglicans also reject this as part of Anglican theology as they reject this transubstantiation. And, um, and of course, 
if you make an oath against transubstantiation, you can't be a good Catholic. So if you want to have a, a public position, if you want to be a member of parliament, for example, you have to take this oath. So you have to publicly denounce your Catholic religion. And you may be secretly a, a Catholic, but then this, this still is a big pressure. And of course, the oath targets Quakers, as I was saying. Right, so Quakers are just out because they're not taking oaths and everybody's requiring all sorts of oaths. Uh, and Quakers are, you know, brutally persecuted during this time period. Uh, we have the Franco-Dutch War, so the France and the Netherlands go to war. And as part of this, we have England uh, allying with Louis of France against the Netherlands. Uh, this only lasts for the first part of the war um, because Dutch privateers demoralized the city of London. So I talked about privateering. Here's another uh, official institution of privateering by the Dutch against the English, and the English are doing it too. So the English are, you know, giving out grants of privateering, um, you know, which is essentially legalized piracy. And, um, but the Dutch privateers are much more effective at shutting down the shipping uh, logistics of the city of London. And if you mess with the city of London, then you're not going to have support in Parliament. So, so uh, England bows out of the war, and um, but the war continues on. And one of the highlights of this is the rise to notoriety of William of, of Orange. And I mentioned him early as a as a prince. He was born as the Prince of Orange. Um, he distinguishes himself as a hero of Protestants against Cath Catholic Louis XIV. And uh, William of Orange is quite effective as, um, as a general on the battlefield as well. So Louis has a grand you know, reputation on the battlefield. William of Orange meets him on the battlefield and, and uh, you know, these guys are head to head, which really raises the the um, the notoriety and reputation of William of Orange, and he's the hero of Protestants. Okay, progressively he becomes uh, the stadtholder, the executive of the main states in the Netherlands, so the Union of uh, uh, the Republic. Um, each state had its own stadtholder, which would be like maybe like a governor. In in uh, our way of thinking about like the governor of California or something like that. And William is the stockholder in several states and runs these several states as a unified um, government unit. Uh, he is of nobility. So this is a little different than when Cromwell was running the protectorate, uh, but um, but this executive position of stadtholder is very constrained by the parliaments of each state. So William is not exercising any kind of absolute um, uh, control. He's more of a figurehead type person. And of course, he's very busy uh, fighting the war and everything like that. Um, and he marries now uh, Mary, who is the daughter of James, uh, uh, of James, Duke of York. Now, James, uh, Duke of York, is not very excited about this. He's a Catholic, and Mary is marrying the big Protestant hero of the Netherlands. But, um, but this is negotiated uh, actually by the chief minister of Charles, and uh, they push it through even against the reservations of James in order to form an alliance with the Netherlands and, and avoid more conflict with them and to send a signal to the, uh, the country. Politically, it's a good move because now 
it, again, it's these mixed signals. Are, are we, is Charles currying favor with Louis or is he currying favor with the Netherlands now? Is he currying favor with Louis? Is he conferring favor with William? It's hard to tell. Uh, mixed signals. And of course, in the background, the public doesn't know about it. But uh, the chief minister, Danby, does know about the secret treaty with Louis. Louis is still paying Charles all this time. Even as they ally with the Netherlands against Louis, Charles is still getting paid in secret. Um, and they're still coordinating. Uh, in late 1678, the Catholic Parliament uh, comes into uh, disarray. So there's a long standing fear that just is kind of growing. It's like, again, there's the mixed signal is Charles occurring favor with Louis or with William now? And is he really a Catholic? Or is he trying to make the Anglican church more like the Catholic church and more rigid in order to just make a monarchy that's not based on Roman Catholicism, but based on a kind of reformed Anglicanism that he can use in the same way that the Roman Catholic church was used against uh, authentic Protestant believers. Um, and so, this threat of absolute uh, monarchy using the Church of England in some way is is suspected in the Parliament, and so there's speeches and and uh, propositions uh, about this sort of thing. In the midst of this, there there's this public phenomenon of the Popish plot. It's a conspiracy theory. It's kind of like a QAnon type thing, um, where every Catholic is somehow involved in this convoluted. A story of conspiracy to kill King Charles, um, which on the face of it doesn't, you know, just like with QAnon, it doesn't hold water, but somehow gains traction, not only with the general popula population, but also with, um, with Charles himself and, and with mem high ranking members of parliament. Uh, five Catholic lords are excluded from the House of Lords. So there's there's some uh, Roman Catholics in the House of Lords that have been conforming to the degree, the degree that they needed to conform, making the oaths and all this kind of stuff, uh, but nonetheless are suspected in the Popish plot and are excluded. And um, Chief Minister uh, Lord Danby, who I mentioned just a bit ago, is impeached um, for something separate. He's impeached for his signatures that are on the secret communications with Louis. So as Charles is negotiating with Louis and receiving payments from Louis, and they are creating documents and Louis uh, envoy to England leaks these documents to parliament, to the English parliament. And Danby's signature is on the documents. So he clearly knows about these secret dealings with Louis. And so the, the, the secret relationship with Louis comes to light uh, to some extent, and Danby is put on the hook for it. Now, uh, Charles's signature is also on the documents, but Parliament is not going to impeach Charles, right? That, that's back to the Civil War. Um, so Lord Danby is the scapegoat for this. And then they also throw in stuff about the Popish plot. And um, now they don't convict him. Um, he is impeached, he doesn't get convicted. Parliament is prorogued and then dissolved by Charles in January, probably in order to to stop the uh, the trial for the impeachment, uh, because Lord Danby is his right hand man. A new parliament is called. It's called the Habeas Corpus Parliament because the only legislation they passed was an act of habeas corpus, which uh, instituted into law the um, the principle of habeas corpus, going back to the Magna Carta. Um, 
but it's argued there that just because parliament was dissolved doesn't mean that the trial of Danby can't can't go on and they lay into Danby they imprison him for treason against the parliament now here they use that precedent of treason as initially applied to Charles the first they against parliament right Charles was the first person to be ever charged with treason against the parliament because treason before that point had always been conceived of as treason against the monarch but Danby is tried for treason but he can't be treasonous against Charles because Charles's signature is on the document so he's charged for treason against parliament. So now we have a weird hybrid, uh, you know, sort of situation going on because of this earlier history. And Earl of Shaftesbury uh, is actually the leading proponent of, of, uh, of trying Danby and, and convicting him. Uh, but he also introduces the exclusion bill, which which is a proposal to exclude James of York, the Duke of York, from succeeding to the throne. He's the heir apparent now. Remember that Catherine uh, had four miscarriages, so it doesn't look like they're going to have a child. And James is next in line. And uh, Shaftesbury introduces a, a bill, a proposal to exclude him from uh, the throne. This causes the exclusion crisis, and Charles quickly dissolves the habeas corpus parliament. It only lasts from March to July in 1679. Then the next parliament is called. So they try to continue on, okay, let's try it again. New elections, call up a new parliament. Um, Charles, you know, so the elections come in. So Charles now knows who the members of parliament are and maybe things don't look good. He's waiting for the right timing. So he prorogues parliament preemptively before they ever meet, he delays the date on which they're supposed to meet and uh, which he's able to do as monarch. And, but once they meet in October of 1680, so now we're in the late days of 1680, the exclusion crisis is still going on. Parliament is, uh, people are, are presenting bills uh, to exclude James. And it's in this uh, parliament that the Tories and the Whigs emerge. And for a long time, for decades, um, uh, even uh, you know, a century after this, and even today in, in parliament in England, uh, the Tories, you know, there's still, uh, uh, a party that's called the Tories. Uh, the Whigs ha have uh, devolved away, but um, but all the way up through the 19th century, it was the Tories versus the Whigs, and and this even came over into United States politics. Um, the Tories and the Whigs emerge at this time. The Tories are the Royalists who support Charles. The Whigs are the you know what were earlier called the Commonwealth's men who were Republican, and they wanted to institute a strong uh, uh, parliamentary monarchy. So the Tories want a monarch who has some arbitrary absolute power, maybe slightly constrained, but the Whigs want a heavily constrained monarch <laughs> and, and create something that looks like a republic, but with a figurehead monarch. Uh, this is quickly dissolved, uh, you know, in January, so just a couple of months in, and now we're into uh, uh, 1681. The the Oxford Parliament is called, or they actually meet in Oxford rather than meeting in London. An exclusion bill is introduced. They're dissolved very quickly by Charles. Um, and then, uh, and then Charles just never calls another parliament. 
So from 1681 to 1685, a good four years uh, plus, um, Charles ru rules as an absolute monarch without any oversight from parliament. So here we have the restoration of absolute monarchy. So we've gone through Charles the first, he rules as a arbitrary absolute monarch for 11 years. That results in the civil war and the rise of the long parliament and the Commonwealth. The protectorate kind of falls apart at the end of the long parliament. And then we have the restoration of the monarchy as a constrained monarchy. And now we're all the way back to absolute monarchy and Charles II ruling very much like his father did uh, for a number of years in an arbitrary fashion. Um, there's a heightened fear uh, that he's going to just restore the Roman Catholic Church in England. There's the Rye House plot, which seems to be a pretty serious plot to assassinate Charles and James both so that succession is taken care of. Let's just eliminate them. And uh, these are uh, uh, Whigs who wanna restore the Commonwealth. Uh, it is uncovered. And in the, as the story leaks out, this creates a big degree of sympathy for Charles and actually ends up solidifying his position as absolute monarch. Uh, and Charles takes the opportunity to increase his repression of dissent. So increase the, the persecution of religious separatists like uh, the Puritans and the Quakers and to imprison and otherwise harass political enemies. Um, so that it's uh, you know bad news for people who are talking, speaking up against uh, Charles, but the general population is largely in favor of Charles. Uh, and this is when uh, Charles dies in 1685. Okay, so I'm going to cut that off there, and then I'll cover uh, James, who who does succeed uh, to the throne.